ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Otto, your host this evening for Radically Right. We're going to take a bite out of this new world order the very best that we can. But I'd like to start off each program with a prayer. And I always invite you to join me in prayer, and I ask that you don't just listen to me pray. Add your voice so that a multitude is praying together. Let us pray. Dear Yahweh, God of good, creator of all the universe, God of Abraham and his sons, Ishmael and Isaac, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We ask that you shelter us from the forces of evil. Bless our minds with discernment and our voices with your word. Guide our steps that we may follow your way. Cause the new world order to fail and its conspirators to be exposed and defeated. Give us courage, health, determination, and material resources. Keep us in the hollow of your hand and shrouded in your Holy Spirit. For we pray in the name of your only begotten Son, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. Welcome back to Radically Right. This is Jack Otto, your host for this Saturday, May 26, 2007. This program is dedicated to expanding the truth of God Almighty's plan for the future and exposing the truth about the forces of evil and their plans for our future. Uh, we are really poised on the very precipice of destiny. Are we going to be free people with a constitutionally limited republic, or are we the subjects of an all-powerful super state that has a right to tell us what to do as a an obligation to run it. At least the desire, they have that passion to dominate. Uh, we've got a caller already. Uh, I think it's Don from New Mexico. Would you speak up, Don? Because I'm having a little trouble hearing. Um, being laid out in all the Masonic symbolism, is that what you were talking about? Right, yeah. yes. Uh, they have several things. They First of all, if you... Uh, Note that some of the, the White House and the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial and a couple other places make up the, the star, the Masonic star. Some of them make up, in combination, make what is uh, the compass and the square. And we know that the White House itself started off by George Washington, who laid the cornerstone in full Masonic regalia. Matter of fact, there's a picture. Somebody commemorated the event by taking a, uh, making a, uh, a painting of that ceremony. The Masons really have a lot more to do with what's going on here than what they like to admit. Did you have anything else you wanted to say, John? No, I just want to say you're doing a great job and keep it up. Uh, thank you, sir. I'd like to do very, that myself. I really would like to uh, see what, what can be done to put a, a stop to this new world order that seems to be running away with our our rights and our freedom. You know, our, we're the people who are the beneficiaries, the recipients of what our parents, our forefathers did. They threw a king off our back. Set up freedom. Outlined a constitution to protect that freedom, and now we're afraid to talk to our public servants about them not following that constitution. So many people quiver and shake. They just can't believe that 
anybody would ask him to put it on the line for freedom again. And we were warned by four, our forefathers that if we did not maintain freedom, if we allowed it to slip through our fingers, it would have to be reclaimed at the price of treasure and toil, sometimes blood and life. Hey, thank you for your call, John. We appreciate all you do for us. You know, that Constitution is important. Now, there's those first ten amendments to the Constitution, the ones we know as the Bill of Rights. And Congress was prohibited from enacting any laws that would trans trespass on those rights. And when government was created, certain powers were withheld from their authority. And there is a one notable uh, exception, and that's Washington, D.C. And in, in that 10-mile by 10-mile square section of what used to be the part, uh, be part of the state of Maryland, Washington, D.C. is under the complete control of Congress. And in that jurisdiction, they establish military law that stemmed from the high seas. It's called admiralty or maritime jurisdiction. Now, in the Constitution, under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, says that that Constitution yields power to Congress, but only in that exclusive D.C. area, as well as ports, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. Now, when he was President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson set out a couple of characters called Lewis and Clark. They did an expedition. Now, we oftentimes see the paintings where, where they're going around with canoes, but the truth of the matter is they didn't use canoes. They used longboats. Because wherever you can drag a longboat from one port to the next, all in between comes under the auspices of that Maritime law, that admiralty jurisdiction. Ah, oh, that Constitution would have been a nice document to have kept. See, after the Civil War, amendment, another amendment was added to the Constitution, and, and it was done illegally. The people with the South told that they had to ratify it. Many times you do something under coercion, it's null and void. And what that 14th Amendment did is it created a new form of citizenship called Citizens of the United States. Up until that time, the United States of America had a small U. It, the states bound together were the states of America. And the word united only implied that they were cohesive. It was not part of the name. But that new form of citizen of the citizens of the United States put people into the Washington, D.C. citizenship of the capital United States of America. When prior to that time, there was only citizens of the states of America, with the lowercase u in United was a stand, but not part of the name. Now, caution is warranted in that just jurisdiction because Congress literally has tyrannical rule there. And such citizenship subjects you to rule where rights do not exist. And unfortunately, people do not realize that they are subjecting themselves to precisely that when they check off the box on an income tax form that indicates they are... Welcome back to Radically Right. This is your host, Jack Otto. We've been talking about the 14th Amendment, the one that created a new class of citizenship, a class wherein you belonged to Washington, 
indicating that most people don't realize they're subjecting themselves to precisely that when they check off the box on your income tax form that indicates you are a United States citizen. And for most people, it would be anathema to check off a box that said or he or she was not a U.S. citizen. But that's precisely what is needed to keep your sovereignty and your membership with the state of America. Now, the courts have been declaring that people contractually join this jurisdiction by obtaining a Social Security card. That is a lie. Before latches can take place in an adhesion contract, there must be full disclosure. And no one ever told you you were giving up your sovereignty and joining a new jurisdiction when you signed up for a Social Security card. Yet that is the scam being run on the people. They don't find out about, out about this new jurisdiction until they're in court getting the shaft. And whenever that maneuver is used, you must claim fraud based on non-disclosure. The silent denotes agreement. And much of what government gets away with is because people do not know enough about the law to make a timely objection. There was an organization here in the Detroit area of Patriots called Justice Pro Se. And this motto covers... It well, when they say, know your rights or lose them. If you don't know your rights, you cannot object to somebody violating them. Your failure to object is construed to be consent. And then government's out of its container, and usurping authority was never meant to have. Like the genie from a lamp or a bottle, it's much more difficult to get it back into the bottle than it was to release the scamp. One of the most important steps for a free man to take is to gain an understanding of the Constitution for the United States of America and to study Supreme Court opinions regarding it. And they're right. I've got some high court decisions that will only be of value if you understand them and remember them. One of the port, most important ones, Barbary versus Madison. The site on that is 4 U.S. 137. And in Barbary versus Madison, it says very clearly, the Constitution of these United States is the supreme law of the land. Any law that is repugnant to the Constitution is null and void from its very inception. Now, we had people in World War II time tell us, oh, no, it's, it's treaties that are the supreme law of the land. But I think Thomas Jefferson was right when he said, how could the Senate by itself do what the whole of government was prohibited from doing. Here's another nice site, Shapiro versus Thompson. 394F2D face 486. In Shapiro versus Thompson, it says the claim and exercise of a constitutional right cannot be converted to a crime. Just let them catch you packing a, a piece and find out how important that Second Amendment is to you. Seems like they convert that to a crime with some regularity. Another Supreme Court decision worth mentioning here is Burdock versus Pennsylvania. That site is 319 U.S. 105. A state 
may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution. No state shall convert a liberty into a privilege, license it, and attach a free fee to it. And we see that happening. Now, we have a right to travel. Now, they want to let us believe that driving down the road in your car, when you're turning that wheel, that's not traveling, that is driving. And yet, we find that our laws are thwarted at every chance we can by the very bureaucrats that call themselves public servants. They may say the words servants, but they sure do act like masters. And there's one called Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham. That site of that one is 373 U.S. 262. And it says, the Supreme Court saying, if the state converts a liberty into a privilege, the citizen can engage in the right with impunity. Now, that's what the Supreme Court says, but however, some of these lower courts aren't going along with that any longer, and they seem to want to deliver tyranny because you exercise some of your rights. Now, there's another Supreme Court decision, U.S. versus Bishop. That site is 412 U.S. 346, and it says very clearly, if you have relied on prior decisions of the Supreme Court, you have a perfect defense for willfulness. See, you have to not accidentally break a law, but you have to intend to break a law. At least it used to be that way. I think now they have a more liberal attitude towards it. We must remember that the neocons are the paleo-communists. Here's another Supreme Court decision, Boyd versus the U.S., D-O-Y-D. And the site on that is 116 U.S. 616. And it says, constitutional provisions for the security of person and property should be liberally construed. The court is to protect against any encroachment of a constitutionally secured liberty. But they sure don't seem to be following that. Now, we hear about the Miranda warnings, and that comes from Miranda versus Arizona. The site on that was 384 U.S. 436. And it says where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation that would abrogate them. Yet we see that happen with some regularity. Then there's another Supreme Court decision, Breyers versus the U.S., 273 U.S. 28. It says, regarding unlawful search and seizure, rights must be interpreted in favor of the citizen. Constitutional provisions for the security of the person and property are to be liberally construed, and it is the duty of the court to be watchful for the constitutional rights of the city, the citizen, and against any stealthy encroachment thereon. Well, that sure seems to have fallen by the wayside. They're not looking out for us anymore. They're looking for ways that they can mince words and shave the law. Suck the after-tax dollars right out of our pocket. It's like that. It's like the law that you break when you come up to the stop sign and you think you've stopped but they can notice that your tires were turning at a rate of one millimeter per day, and so it's technically not a really a stop, and they get to suck those after-tax dollars right out of your pocket. Now, 
When you're driving down the road, you look up in that rear view mirror. I want to tell you about that in just a, a minute. we got to go to a break. We'll be right back. Please stay tuned. about some of the Supreme Court decisions that are really quite relevant to you and I as patriots. And there's Norton versus Shelby County, 118 U.S. 425, where it says an unconstitutional act is not a law. It confers no rights. It imposes no duty. It affords no protection. It creates no office. It is in legal contemplation, as in the operative, as though it had never been passed. Now, here's some really good ones here. All three of these are applicable to what I'm going to say next. Uh, Owen versus Independence, Bain versus Sibidoff, and Haffer versus Milo. Under that one, we find out that officers of the court have no immunity from liability when violating a constitutional right and may be held personally liable for damages under 42 U.S.C.A. 1983. Or they are deemed to know the law and knowing that they will be liable for injurious conduct creates incentives for officials to err on the side of protecting citizens' constitutional rights. Then there's Memphis Bank and Trust versus the state of Tennessee at L. Garner. That's 459 U.S. 392, 103 SBT 692. Title One. Title 31, U.S.C. Section 742, and I quote, except as otherwise provided by law, all stocks, bonds, treasury notes, and other obligations of the United States shall be exempt from taxation by or under state or municipal or local authority. This exemption extends to every form of taxation that would require that either the obligation or the interest thereon, or both, be considered directly or indirectly in the computation of a tax. Gee, that's interesting, isn't it? Then there's Brushever versus Union Pacific. And this was an important piece of law, 240 U.S. 1. This was from 1915. And it says there, the rule of apportionment still applies Direct taxation. The 16th Amendment did not give Congress any new taxing authority over the state. Yeah, that's a Supreme Court decision. It says that. Then there's Bailey, Bailey versus Alabama, 219 U.S. 219 of the year 1911. And it says there the right to work and own the property of one's labor is an unalienable right, protected under the 1st, 13th, and 14th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, we've got Frank from West Virginia waiting on the line. Uh, speak up for me, would you, Frank, because I'm having yes. a little trouble hearing tonight. Yes, I certainly will. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, this question uh, is in regards to right to travel. Now, I've been looking for ways to travel with the ownership of my car, either as some, as some type of a venue other than owned by the state. And I understand the corporate structure and how it's set up to own our cars and put, put us as, or rather as trustees. Basically, uh, I was uh, pulled over for an expired uh, license tag, the uh, yearly tax that they charge us for renting their motor vehicle. Um, after I'd witnessed the same uh, deputy 
uh, commit two uh, more major infractions uh, in front of me, and he eventually got behind me and happened to uh, see that I had an expired tag. So anyhow, um, at this point, uh, he asked me for my driver's license, and I asked him if I was under arrest or if I was free to go. Uh, he said, no, you're not uh, under arrest. Uh, you're not free to go. You're being detained. I said, I can't proceed without without the uh, without uh, assistance of uh, counsel. Oh. And so, anyhow, he still went through with this spiel and told me to give me his license and so forth, so I complied. Um, after waiting for over half an hour, he finally came back for, with a ticket and said that uh, my tag was expired, which I already knew that. And anyhow, at this point, uh, he told me to uh, sign the ticket. And I told me that uh, my legal counsel tells me not to sign any contracts without his being able to review it first and without my full understanding. And I don't know what it is that I'm signing. And he told me if I don't sign it, then he's going to arrest me and take me downtown, put me in jail. And I said very politely, well, I certainly don't want to be arrested. And so... I went ahead and signed the ticket, did which you get the was word initials U D after it. I put yes, I did under duress and coercion, and and then on top of that, on top of my uh, appellation, I put without prejudice U C C one dash two o seven. Handed it back to him. He gave me a copy. Uh, on that uh, ticket, it says that. I have agreed with that signature to appear uh, before the court uh, before or on the day of June 5th. And I was thinking, if I have, I was trying to look at my options at this point, uh, see if I have any other than just going along with the same uh, game that I've uh, bought into over the years and just going ahead and uh, uh, continuing to, uh, get that uh, sticker taken care of and going before the court and just simply uh, asking for a reprieve uh, of the uh, judgment since I went ahead and had the tax uh, rent taken care of. Um, but at this point, I'm just wondering if I can appear at the court at a previous date to June 5th while this man is working, possibly. He, he, he told me to sign it and show up. Well, if I show up and he doesn't, wouldn't he be? Uh, wouldn't the case have to be dropped since for his failure to show? You're on some. You're on some shaky ground. You've got the right to travel, but they want to tell you that you're not traveling because the turning of that steering wheel in, in your vehicle and pushing on the gas pedal. Is not traveling, that's driving. Right. And driving comes from, well, it antedates automobiles. You used to have, if you had a team of horses out on the roads and you were using them to make a living, then you were driving. Mm -hmm. You were selling out of a wagon or something like that. That was driving. But if you just had your stuff in your wagon going up or down the road, not selling. Mm -hmm. Not using it for commerce. Right. Then that was just traveling, and you have every right in the world to do it. I agree. Well, let I me agree. cover one more of these, uh, a couple more of these Supreme Court decisions. Well, here's one I think you're going to think is relevant. I hope you've got paper and pencil here. Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Robertson versus the Department of Public Works. That's 180 Wash. 133, comma, 147. Could you repeat those numbers uh, one more time? 180 WASH, like in Washington. Mm -hmm. 133, comma, 147. Okay. Justice Tolman stated, complete freedom of the highways is so old and well-established a blessing that we have forgotten the days of the robber barons and toll roads. And 
yet, under an act like this, arbitrarily administered, the highways can be completely monopolized if, through lack of interest, the people submit. Then they may look to see the most sacred of their liberties taken from them one by one by more or less rapid encroachment. Here's another one, Thompson versus Smith. That's 154 FE 579. Okay, we got a break coming up here. Uh, hold on a minute, Frank. We'll be right back. We'll finish this up. Please stay tuned, folks. Welcome back to Radically Right. We've got Frank from West Virginia on the phone, and some of his questions fit right in with the Supreme Court decisions that we've been talking about. Frank, here's another one for you. Thompson versus Smith. 154, S like in Sally, E like in elephant, 579. Now, this is an important decision. <clears throat> it says, that the right of the citizen to travel upon the public highways and to transport his property thereon, either by horse-drawn carriage or by automobile, not a mere privilege which a city can prohibit or permit at will, but a common right, which he has under the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In the several states of America, driver's licenses were issued to those who used the public highways and byways in the pursuit of commerce. Now, every individual has the right to travel and to take his property thereon, but those who wish to use the common roads for business had to obtain a license. Now, there is a distinction between the two words, traveler and driver. Yes. And according to Bouvier's Law Dictionary, 1914 edition, on page 940, we find a driver defined. That dictionary says, a driver is one employed in conducting a coach, carriage, wagon, or other vehicle. Those who are not employed in the use of the highways are just traveling, which is the exercise of a right. And government has confounded the issue by requiring commercial driver's license. This presumes that ordinary driver's licenses are not commercial and that the steady and stealthy encroachment of a constitutional right are broadened again. Yes, if I can make a note, I didn't give him a state driver's license. I gave him a driver's license under a separate uh, sovereign government apart from the U.S. corporate government or the state corporate government. So uh, his, he didn't charge me with anything concerning my license, but he did concerning the uh, sticker on the back of the, which would be the property tax, which I, I'm guessing would still fall under these same premises, these same, uh, 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 the right to travel. Well, it sure seems to me that you own that vehicle. You yes. paid for it, didn't you? Yes, sir. Then you paid for it. You own it. Why do you have to have permission from them to own it? Very you well. Like to own that vehicle. Very, very good point. Very good point. Um, that's uh, something I certainly will uh, look up. And I'll bring to the uh, court hearing, and I'll report back after the findings, which should be rather soon, the next week or two, since I have to uh, do that by the 5th. It's hard to do anything without a lawyer these days. Are you going to Are you going to be a pro se litigant? Yes, sir. You know, sometimes that being a pro se litigant. Get things said that you really want said, whereas your own lawyer will tell you, "Oh no, you gotta, you gotta just lay down and let them do it to you." 
Exactly. That's why I'm going to do it myself. And plus, since it's just a traffic uh, violation, uh, I won't be seeking any other legal counsel uh, from a lawyer. I don't think that anybody would know as much as you and, and uh, several books that I have. And I'll do some, spend some time in the law library uh, over next week. But you know, there's a really nice book that I've got. It's called, you know, it's called the Outlaws Bible, and it tells about how to get yourself through the system, what they can do to you, what they can't do to you. The Outlaws Bible, you say? Yes, it's called the Outlaws Bible. Do you know the author's name? I'll look that up. Well, let's see if it's right here. Um, or if it's for sale on your website. No, I don't have that for sale. It's just a good book. and Yeah, the Outlaw's Bible, here it is. And it is a, by a guy called himself E.X. Boozy. So the, he used to be an alcoholic, and he's cleaned up his act. And he's been through the system enough times that he had something to say to help people out. Well, that sounds like a good one to buy. I think I'll do that. And can you spell that last name for me? I couldn't hear it very clearly. Boozy. B like in boy. O O Z I E. Okay. All right. I'll certainly uh, I'll look for that and uh, and purchase that as soon as possible. And I appreciate your help. That's uh, uh, in bringing up those uh, precedents on that. I'll I'll look those up as well. So. Uh, I'll let you, you know, know how it goes. There was a recent mm -hmm. Supreme Court decision just a few years ago that said we don't honor any Supreme Court decisions that were made before 1933. Mm. I don't know how they can do that, but that's the truth of the matter. Oh, uh, a kangaroo, kangaroo court would yes, say I mean, something like that. Would, yes, kangaroo court that were... Where the kangaroos are the engineers on the train as you're getting railroaded. Okay, thank you very much, Frank. We appreciate your call. We're going to be back in just a few moments here. We got our half hour break. Welcome back. We've been talking about. Some Supreme Court decisions, some relevant ones, <clears throat> things that are relevant to the Constitution. And I'd like to bring up the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution for the United States of America, the one that promises that the common law would always prevail. Yet, common police courts have literally disappeared, supplanted by state law, statute law. In these maritime or admiralty jurisdiction courts, the proceedings seem strange to those who understand constitutional guarantees and find them denied in that jurisdiction. Between maritime and commercial law, ignorant sovereigns are ground to poverty and sometimes penitentiary slavery. Because of their four-color flag, the red, white, and the blue with gold fringe changed the, the jurisdiction to admiralty, and sovereign free people do not belong there. If we could only file a common law abatement to keep these rascals at bay. Ritz are important. Ritz is subpoena. All kinds of writs of mandamus. We all have to be exceedingly careful as to which documents we affix our signature. Big Brother government was once our public servant, and as such had a fiduciary responsibility not to trick the free people out of their rights. Failure to disclose the grave implication in these adhesion contracts is a fraud and therefore they can be repudiated with just cause. One of the ways to prevent 
latches from occurring is to precede each contractual signature with a phrase that indicates all rights reserved. Now, we just talked to Ted from, I think it was Ted up in Alaska that uh, was talking about when he signed, he put down, without prejudice, UCC 1-207. And in the Universal Commercial Code, it says that a person may retain their rights by doing just exactly that. The words without pre prejudice means you're not prejudice, prejudicing your constitutional rights. Because you do have a right to sign them away if you want. It would be a stupid thing to do, but you have the right to do that. And the affectation of a signature does not surrender any rights in that case. And it's rec I would recommend that you get a little rubber stamp that says without prejudice, UCC 1-207. I got one that I can palm right in my hand, and they don't even see that it's part of the document because it's typed just like the rest of the stuff. It's not something you've handwritten in. Since most of America was duped into joining the United States of America jurisdiction, most of America needs to opt out. And fraud makes the enforcement of such a contract unlawful and running the assumption that people don't need to know that they were giving up critical rights is the dirty little secret that voids such fallacious contracts that are literally no more or less than fraud. And it doesn't take much extrapolation to see that public servants who connive to deprive free people of their God-given rights should face treason charges. Those unalienable rights are sacrosanct, and no one may put a lien against them, let alone defraud the people at a wholesale level. Yes, that's what every free person must guard against. A free man can sign away his rights. And this can come at a time when a person is being intimidated by some officer to sign something with which they disagree. And if the pressure is too great, do like he did. Try to fix the initials UD after your signature so it, you can show in court that it was done under duress and that the same thing is not signing. Tread cautiously in the government jungle. There are many snakes in the grass. And most of them believe they are public masters, not servants, masters. Uh, we got Tom from Florida. Tom, I'm having a little trouble hearing, so speak up for me, would you please? A few years ago, these, our supposed uh, Supreme Court said that they uh, only answer to an international court now. Yeah. And your fighter, as I saw it on a video, they were tearing the people's uh, papers up, throwing them in their face, throwing them up in the air, or not even taking them at all. Well, I think we have to agree with the Founding Fathers that said if you let your liberty slip through your fingers, they may have to be repurchased at the price of treasure and toil, even blood and life. Bush and uh, Cheney have got people out right now buying up uh, private uh, and family-owned ammunition factories. They're not going to get mine. No, I'm not talking about that. I said that Bush and Cheney are out right now buying ammunition factories up in this country. You know, it doesn't take too much for you to have one of those ammunition factories. It's easy enough. All you got to do is buy the reloading equipment, and they come in quite a quite a range of prices. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Tom. Here we are. Are we free people? Or are we the subjects of an all-powerful super state that has the right to tell you? What to do? Can they really twist that Constitution and say it doesn't apply to you anymore? They seem to be doing it, getting away with it. When the truth of the matter is, they should be brought up on charges. If we are free people and government was 
put together, like it says in our Declaration of Independence. Because they're way out of line. And the punishment for what they're doing, which is treason, the punishment is capital. And I'd like to see some of these guys charged and tried. Of course, the nice Yiddish boys that are holding office when you go up before the nice Yiddish judge will see it their way, won't they? It doesn't make you really feel like you're free people anymore. And I personally would like to get back to that notion of being free. You know, it is liberty that gives us the sweetness, the savor of life. And liberty is where you get to make choices. And we find that we have less and less choices that we can make. We find that we must get permits for gov- from government for just about anything we're going to do. You know, you got to ask yourself, how did these public servants license our rights and sell them to us? You know, I wonder... Would it be a revolution to overthrow the feds and return to the Constitution? There was somebody that once said that war is when the government decides who are our enemy. Revolution is when we do. I think about so many things that have been done so wrong. Now, most of, pe- most of the people do not realize that the folks in New Orleans were disarmed by our military in direct violation of Posse Comitata. And it's a shame. Because people just didn't seem to stand up. The founding fathers gave us that Second Amendment to fight tyranny. It wasn't for hunting game or self-defense. Let me quote that Second Amendment. The militia being necessary. Wait a second. I thought militia was a bad word. We're not supposed to say that. We're not supposed to think we're part of that. The militia being necessary for the security of a free state. The right of the people to own and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's yet. It happens all the time. Now, with cheap excuses, too. Now, we got to take guns away from people. we got to do it for the children. You know what? There are very few people... Very few children that are killed each year by guns. Very few. And if government was really interested in taking guns away because they cared about children so much, they'd put twice as much money into warning us about those five-gallon buckets with a little water in the bottom because twice as many children die each year from these buckets with a little water down in the bottom. They fall into it. And they can't get back out, and they are killed. But yet we don't see much. Television and newspaper and magazine publishing the information to protect people from these five-gallon buckets, which are twice as dangerous to the children. Yeah, we're free to do like we're told. And it seems like inflation is making 
poverty more expensive. Inflation has made it so that we could hardly afford poverty. So we see we're faced with this gestapo. It seems to walk that thin blue line between treason, tyranny. And I really would like to know, when did our public servants become masters? You know, I, I know too much about what's going on not to be a conspiracy theorist. If you're afraid of your government, not really free. I would like, really like to see them legalize freedom. You know, isn't the second permit enough? Here in Michigan, our Constitution is even stronger than the federal Constitution. In our Constitution, when it talks about your right to own and bear arms, it says very clearly, every man has a right to own and bear arms for the defense of himself and the state. But if you don't get a permit, even though the Constitution says that you got a right, if you don't get a permit to carry... They ruin your life. They will throw you in prison for executing one of your rights. I still say it again and again. Isn't that second permit enough? We are on the very precipice. Are we really free people? Or are we the subjects of an all-powerful super state that really does have the right to bug you, tell you what to do? I re- it was a guy named O'Rourke that once said, giving money and power to government is like giving whiskey and car keys teenage boys. When do we say enough is enough? When do we start acting like men? Like we got a pair. There's so many people that cower and shrink back. And I think so often about the works of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the great tome, Gulag Archipelago, that detailed the accounts of the tyranny in the Soviet Union under the USSR's Yiddish regime. In his book, he said, and I quote, how we burned in the prison camps later thinking, what would things have been like if every security operative, when he went out at night to make an arrest, had been uncertain whether he would return alive? Or if during periods of mass arrest, people had not simply sat in their lairs, paling with terror at every bang of the downstairs door and at every step on the staircase but as understood they had nothing to lose and had bully set up in the downstairs hall an ambush of half a dozen people with axes, hammers, pokers, or whatever else was at hand. The organs would very quickly have suffered a long shortage, suffered a shortage of officers, and notwithstanding all of Stalin's thirst, the cursed machine would have ground to a halt. 
they cowered back. We were afraid we'd be next. We hoped it would all blow over. Once we were enslaved, well, we thought of all the things we could have done to stop them. I hear music coming in. We're going to have a break. This is our last break. Be back in just a moment. Please stay tuned and listen to our sponsors. Welcome back to Radically Right. This is Jack Otto, your host for this evening. We've been talking about some of the laws and the Supreme Court decisions associated with them that really are kind of relevant. And there was one of the gentlemen that called earlier and talked about the importance of property. And he noted that passage in the, uh, in the Declaration of Independence that talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I mentioned to him that that word happiness was originally property. And property is important. And I'd like to quote our second president, John Adams. He said, and I quote, the moment the idea is admitted into society that property is not as sacred as as the laws of God, that there is not a force of law and public justice to protect it. Anarchy and tyranny commence. Property must be sacred or liberty cannot exist. And he sure was right. Now, here in Michigan, they had a recent change in the law. See, you were not allowed to defend yourself with a firearm even in your own home. It had to be that they backed you clear up into a place where you had no escape and still were coming at you to, to harm you. Well, we have a new law that says we can protect ourselves and our property. But there was a prosecutor here in the Detroit area that said life is so much more important than property that you shouldn't be able to shoot somebody just because they're breaking in trying to steal your stuff. But the truth of the matter is, we spend almost all of our lives working trying to get a little bit of property. And when somebody comes along and steals your property, they've stolen a good piece of your life. You think back in the old days when the man had a horse and he was out on the range. They used to hang horse feet. The reason is, <clears throat> if you stole somebody's horse out there, you probably killed them. I say again and again, we are on the very precipice of finding out whether or not we are truly free people are the subjects of an all-powerful superstate. Let me remind you once again that freedom isn't free. Somebody's got to pay to bring this to you. I know John Statmiller isn't getting any money from me. I don't have it to send to him. But yet, shortwave, satellite, internet, people in the office, telephones, electricity. They've got to eat, too. Because freedom isn't free, I'm going to ask you to dig in your pocket and do what you can. Send John Statmiller some money. <laughs> 